Hello, welcome back to Am I Neurodivergent, my unexpected 2022 autism and ADHD discovery year. The last couple of weeks I've basically been recapping the University of Kent's fantastic online understanding autism course that I took last summer. Uh, and I'm just going to continue that this week, uh, week three of the free four week course available on the Future Learn platform, which again I'll put a link to in the description of this video. Week three of the course focuses on the history of autism from its first mention up to present day understanding and speculative theories, as well as the prevalence of co-occurring conditions alongside autism and what's needed to support that. So I'm just gonna get fired in using my course notes to, to recap some of the learning I was soaking up this week. Again, the course is mainly facilitated by Dr. Jill Bradshaw, Georgina Watts, and Dr. Damian Milton. And again, I would strongly urge everyone watching uh, to sign up and take the course. It's by a country mile, the most comprehensive, informative, and well-structured resource on understanding autism I've come across uh, for autistic people, practitioners, family members, and partners. Just, just great stuff. As with the previous two weeks, some of this might repeat a few of the things I've raised in previous videos, but I just want to pull all this together at the kind of midpoint of my video series to, to make sure nothing major is being missed. Um, there's different levels of access to the course, I should say. Uh, for free, you have a time-limited four-week access to the course. You can pay to have access to the course for longer. Um, I should also say um, that this is not a paid advert by me from the course. I just loved it, and it's what I was doing at this point in my discovery year. Um, I emailed Dr. Bradshaw and Dr. Milton about a month ago to say I'm going to talk about your course and its content on my YouTube channel. Is that okay? And Dr. Bradshaw said, sure, go ahead. So I would 100% recommend the course, but only because I loved it and think it's great. I'm certainly not shilling it or that I've been asked to or anything like that, just to, just to clear that up. Um, right, history of autism. Autism has always existed, but the first mention of what became known as autism was from the Swiss psychiatrist uh, Paul Eugen Bloiler in the early 20th century, who was studying schizophrenia and referred to the term autismus, stemming from autos, the Greek word for self, and he used it to describe individuals who appeared locked inside themselves and found it difficult to engage in, in real life. He believed there was something innate in certain people leading to these behaviours. Um, next on the timeline is good old Dr. Hans Asperger, see chapter 12 um, on some of the subsequent issues with him. But his importance and influence in understanding autism cannot be understated. Asperger referred to autism in a 1938 lecture describing young boys he was working with that he called his little professors, always boys, um, with autism until relatively recently uh, because patriarchy. These kids he studied were broadly very able and many went on to successful careers, but he noted common behaviours around very focused special interests and being very focused on their own experiences uh, over those of others. Again, believing it was an innate characteristic to those kids. Round about the same time as this in America, Dr. Leo Kanner also adopted the phrase, but he was studying kids with intellectual impairments, which he described as early infantile autism. It was these two initial extreme aspects of recognizing and studying autism that eventually gave rise further down the line to the damaging value judgment labels of high functioning autism um, or later Asperger's syndrome at one end versus what for many years was described appallingly as low functioning autism of the kind Kanner studied where learning difficulties were also present. We, of course, know now, and we looked at that in week one of the course, that the autism spectrum is a genuine multifaceted spectrum, not a straight line spectrum from very autistic to a little bit autistic. But this, unfortunately, is the way it was regarded for many years, in part because these two distinct aspects studied by Asperger and Kanner for different reasons sat more notably outside of normal quote unquote behavior. The course goes on to note that in the children he studied, Kanner 
described an intense desire to be alone and a strong preference for sameness. But in the 1940s, Kanner also introduced a very harmful element in his conclusions around autism, that of the emotionally distant and cold, what would become known, thanks to a guy called Bruno Bettelheim in his, his book, The Empty Fortress, as a refrigerator parent where a lack of affection shown created the need for the child to kind of turn it in on itself. Um, now, Kanner withdrew those conclusions in the late 1960s, but the damage had been done in terms of stigma about the condition and families feeling a degree of shame around anything vaguely connected to autism. We now know what wasn't apparent then, that neurodivergence and autism spectrum conditions have a strong tendency to be hereditary. Dr. Milton mentions that the National Autistic Society here in the UK was set up by parents of autistic kids specifically to fight that stigma and provide support, awareness raising and advocacy. So good can come from shit in a way. Um, through the 50s and 60s, Kanner and Bettelheim's work had taken centre stage, but in the 1970s and 80s, Lorna Wing and Judy Gould in the UK rediscovered Hans Asperger's work, which had fallen out of favour, and the concept of the, <clears throat> the little professors, so-called high-functioning autism, without co-occurring learning disabilities, also became known as Asperger's syndrome. And it was also during this time period that the full concept of the autism spectrum and an underlying condition that could present in very different ways came to the fore, as it became clear that Asperger's studies and Kanner studies were essentially different aspects of the same genetic and biological traits. Um, <clears throat> For reasons I've discussed previously in chapter in chapter 12, and I'm not going to revisit in depth here because it's a very sore subject for a lot of people, Asperger's syndrome has now been removed from current diagnostic criteria. High functioning and low functioning tags have largely been done away with and been replaced by high support needs and low support needs. And all presentations of autism are now considered autism spectrum disorder or increasingly autism spectrum condition as it's not a psychological disorder is just a it's just a genetic difference in saying that there's no single autism gene that can be identified it remains a, a magical goldilocks combination of associated genes that combine with environmental factors to form an individual autism profile the course does touch on the nervousness autistic people have about further genetic research if scientific testing and brain scan technology can be conclusively found to detect an autistic profile, do we go down the Down syndrome avenue with prenatal testing? Do parents get asked if they want an autistic child? These are horrible questions to even have to consider, might be considered if that makes sense, but here we are. Um, humans with diverse ways of thinking and processing, processing <clears throat> information, yay or nay, it's, uh, it's terrifying stuff. We, we still don't know why autism affects a sizable chunk of the population, just that through multiple genetic complexities and interactions that it, it does. The course again reiterates that everything right now is still a theory. Um, we still haven't landed on a solid explanation. What we do know is that sure as hell is an MMR vaccine, a theory that rose to prominence in the 90s, um, but has now been thoroughly discredited. So <clears throat> just to reiterate, again, more people aren't getting autism. We're just becoming increasingly aware of it and the wide spectrum of presentations it inhabits in people. And it's, it's fantastic that the course makes that crystal clear, as some ill-informed public figures still make that damaging connection uh, to this day. The landscape on understanding autism is moving, and um, theories that had precedence historically, refrigerator parents' theory of mind deficits, have now gone, replaced by newer theories from autistic academics and researchers themselves, like Dr. Milton. We only know what our best guesses are today we may get there in terms of complete understanding. We probably will, but we're not there yet. We, P. 
people who loathe ambiguity have to, for the time being at least, live with ambiguity about ourselves as best we can. Fun. <clears throat> Things we do know today, autism is a biological condition, a neurological condition, it's not a psychological disorder. The condition tends to be heritable and tends to run in families, often why parents don't see their own children as different or struggling. Fiona Gullen Scott discusses in the course the controversial theory that certain environmental factors could perhaps trigger a predisposition to autistic traits and make those traits more pronounced than they may otherwise have been. But this theory is um, definitely quite hotly debated and not widely accepted. It's, it's interesting that you can also get kids who've suffered from extreme deprivation or social isolation who look and present as if they're on the autism spectrum, but aren't. And that overlap between trauma response and autistic presentation, again, can be really difficult to parse sometimes. Um, after I got my own diagnosis, for example, I was convinced a really close friend of mine was also on the spectrum, but she did self-test after self-test with, with genuine curiosity and just wasn't. Um, she just suffered a, a substantial amount of neglect and trauma as a child and has a lot of similar presentations to being neurodivergent as an adult. And that matches a kind of learned autism theory where people in extreme situations, um, refugees and asylum seekers, for example, can take on a kind of acquired autism but that's different from biological autism in terms of neuroplasticity and, and fundamental brain wiring. Um, these are all just theories, people bandying around ideas and research and drawing interesting comparators uh, while looking. There are also present day theories around local and global processing that people in the autism spectrum tend to be above average on details, but below average on big picture thinking. I'd personally dispute that theory to a degree. I love systems thinking and try to be quite a big picture thinker, like my master's degree was on global diplomacy, the, the political infrastructure of nation states and whether they remain a substantial global, a uh, sustainable global model for the, the 21st century and beyond. And also, Love them or loathe them for different reasons, but I'd also question putting your Elon Musks or Greta Thunbergs in a box marked not big picture thinkers. Um, anyway, I'm off on a tangent. The, the point the course makes in week three is that theories of autism have slipped and turned over the years, and there is not yet one grand unifying theory of autism. For, for me, it's like the parable of the, the blind men and the elephant. The first... Let me remember this. The first blind man feels the side of the elephant and conclu concludes it's a wall. The second feels the trunk and thinks it's a snake. The third feels the tusk and says it's a spear. The fourth feels the knee and argues it's a tree. The fifth feels the ear and thinks it's a fan. And the sixth feels the tail and believes it's just a rope. Autism and neurodivergence and why some brains are different to others or something, but in terms of concrete understanding and deep subject matter expertise, all we've got now are a basket of bricks, snakes, spears, tree bark and rope from which people build their own base. We'll get there, and, and there have been recent advances in studying brain development and neural connections, for example, but we, we ain't there yet. Right now, it just is. Sometimes things just bees that way. One thing that has become apparent as autism studies and research have advanced into the 21st century is that autism rarely seems to occur on its own in a vacuum. It more often than not seems to co-occur with other conditions. And the course covers where we are today. Um, I'm conscious the course itself is now a few, few years old, but we cover broadly where we are with understanding autism today and the raft of co-occurring conditions that tend to go alongside an autism diagnosis today. Two of the most common co-occurring conditions, or comorbidities, um, as they're often called. Number one, up to 50% of autistic people also have an intellectual disability, or ID. And two, more than 50% of autistic people may also have ADHD. 
a complex combined condition that's increasingly referred to as ADHD that leads to disorganized thinking and is associated with low self-esteem, which is no surprise people who love organization and systems getting stymied by their own co-occurring condition. Um, other co-occurring conditions often found alongside autism could include dyslexia, impacting liter uh, literacy skills, dyspraxia, impacting coordination, anxiety, depression, OCD, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, epilepsy, Tourette's, sleep disorders, CPTSD, um, complex post-traumatic stress disorder, Ehlers-Danlos or hypermobility, eating disorders, food intolerances or digestive system disorders, and gender dysphoria. One of the big overlaps in co-occurring conditions, um, intellectual and developmental disabilities, often also referred to as learning disabilities, that require significant support for an individual in everyday life around self-care, social skills or communication. <coughs> is the primary comorbidity alongside an autism diagnosis at around 50% overlap. There are all sorts of issues with and, and biases around IQ tests, but for better or worse, IQ is still used extensively for determining the extent of these sort of issues. And the course discusses mild learning disability being classed as an IQ between 50 and 69, profound intellectual disability being below 20. Um, those strict criteria are, I think, changing, but broadly the real life effect is experiencing significant challenges around acquiring and learning new skills that can inevitably lead to less opportunities in life being afforded to people uh, in this space, um, people who may well have already acquired skills in other areas. ID is more often than not picked up where infants miss significant developmental milestones and, and co-occurring autism is more often picked up in these cases too because the medical profession actively look for it in this instance. <clears throat> the second big overlap with autism, again potentially in around 50% or even more of autistic people, uh, like I said, is ADHD. We'll get properly into ADHD with my videos shortly. At the, at the time I'd taken this course last year, I still didn't think I had ADHD because I hadn't scored myself accurately the first time I did a self-test. So I didn't pay much attention to this bit of the course first time around. So it's, it's fascinating going back and re-looking at my notes a second time around. Challenges associated with ADHD include poor concentration, difficulty in completing tasks, disorganization, forgetfulness, impulsivity, overactivity, noisiness, performance inconsistency, low self-esteem, poor working memory, clumsiness, social clumsiness, uh, and defiant behavior. Like autism, people with ADHD can hyper-focus on something they're, they're interested in and concentrate for a very long time. But if someone with ADHD is not interested in something, then giving due attention to that thing can be very problematic and challenging for us. ADHD challenges can be helped to a certain degree through medication, but the course is clear that medicating cannot help with autistic challenges. Those will, those will remain. When you're ADHD, medicating and suppressing the ADHD can in fact sometimes negatively amplify your autistic aspects compared to the balance you previously had. So while you'll struggle less with one aspect of yourself by medicating, you might suddenly be struggling more with another aspect. It's, it's, really, it's really complicated. I'm glazing over co-occurring autism and ADHD somewhat in this video. We'll definitely get way deeper into this in future videos, but the course here just touches on it glancingly, and I, I wanted to flag it here as yet another challenging thing uh, to try to negotiate if, if both affect us. Another big overlap is anxiety. Co-occurring anxiety is a huge thing, and the course points out that rates of anxiety on autistic people are considerably higher than average. I mean, show me someone on the autism spectrum who isn't troubled by the anxiety dragon. Um, George describes very well how her own anxiety and depression are so entwined with her autism that it's difficult for her to parse them or work out where 
one condition ends and the other begins. Being autistic in a neurotypical world and just what George describes as getting it wrong consistently year after year causes anxiety and magnifies social anxiety over time. It also <clears throat> often causes PTSD and CPTSD and such can be the stress of living this way over an extended period. Jill then asks George about particular situations that make her anxious and George describes fantastically um, in a way at this point of my journey I hadn't heard before and that's her, her autism being like having what she calls a deficit of prediction and this was like a halogen light bulb going off in my brain because it just perfectly described so many things I'd lived with and tried to cope with over the years. She describes how Anything she can do to make her life more predictable is a huge win for her, like planning things meticulously so they're less likely to deviate from a script. Again, huge recognition for me. I'd particularly started to do this more and more in lockdown, literally scripting what I wanted to say in meetings and then reading it out verbatim with a, with a split screen. I didn't used to do this, but I think the more anxious I got in lockdown, the more control and predictability I needed to have over every aspect of interacting with the outside world. I, I found I suddenly could script entire conversations in a way I couldn't before um, when I was going into an office without looking really weird, and I now could. But then COVID ended and we were told right back into the office, but by then I'd got used to literally scripting every two-way interaction with other people, which I've been learning to undo again over the past year. Um, and that's actually pretty much bang on the point. I had my stress breakdown and self-diagnosed, actually, being told to come back into the office after lockdown. I've just realized that, which is interesting. Um, Anyway, aut uh, autistic prediction deficits um, really rang true for me, and it's a great way of getting to the nub of how things can affect us. And actually, a concept neurotypicals can understand quite easily too, if, if you're struggling to help them get it. Um, try going with prediction deficits uh, with a few examples. It, it does actually seem to land better than most explanations. So, yeah. Autistic prediction deficits and anxiety. Actually, just every aspect of autism and anxiety, they're so entwined with each other. I can probably do a separate video just on that. In fact, I almost certainly will uh, do a separate video on that. But in closing, I just echo another of George's remarks that for her, anxiety is a response to autistic living. And I'm pretty sure that's where a lot of my own anxiety stems from. I think my anxiety built up over time, year on year, every year getting worse and worse from having to live and work in ways that felt counterintuitive and um, culminating with getting a, a diagnosis of anxiety disorder last year at the same time as my ASD diagnosis. The course concludes by reiterating, re, uh, reiterating how common co-occurring conditions can be with neurodivergence and how even where one condition has been identified, other conditions uh, can be easily overlooked because of what's known as diagnostic overshadowing, the assumption that every quote-unquote unusual manifestation is down to that one first thing that's been diagnosed, whereas it could easily be a comorbidity at play rather than the primary diagnosis. And George makes the point this is very common with autism, particularly around people diagnosed later in life and within that particularly with women. Often a whole raft of things, which undoubtedly are also present, like anxiety and depression are diagnosed, but one of the primary things which is causing the underlying difficulties with the individual, i.e. autism, is completely missed or overlooked because there's overlap with something else. The, the uncomfortable truth that too many GPs still simply don't see autism, particularly still with girls and women, is acknowledged in the course as well. Um, diagnostic overshadowing, it's, it's a big thing. Um, there's a really good website called Misdiagnosis Monday, um, part of the, the Neurodivergent Insights page, um, that I'll put a link uh, to in the description to this video. It has a really nice series of Venn diagrams of overlapping conditions. Um, it's, just, it's just fascinating, and I would strongly encourage rabbit-holing down into it if you've not visited uh, that site 
before. Um, so anyway, week three of the course basically concludes uh, bringing us up to date that co-occurring conditions alongside autism are incredibly common and can substantively alter autistic presentations and lead to very different strengths and challenges. Again, another reason why the autism spectrum can be such a confusing concept for so many people to grasp. It's actually quite unusual to be just autistic. There's usually at least one thing, sometimes multiple other things going on, influencing the way autism presents externally and affects the individual internally. There's no one-size-fits-all autism and there's no one-size-fits-all support solution for autism. A holistic approach tailored to every individual is necessary to amplify strengths and minimize challenges and find ways to let people, wherever they are on the spectrum and whatever co-occurring conditions they've got bumping and grinding, grinding alongside their autism, to be their best selves and live their best lives. Um, and, and that's bloody difficult. Um, but that's the future. Uh, and that's, uh, that's where I'll leave it for this week. Um, yeah, thank you. Hopefully this was a helpful summary of the history of our understanding of autism. Um, hopefully see you next Sunday for another one. Please do like the video, please hit subscribe to the channel and click to receive all notifications so you know when I've posted new content. Um, thanks for all your comments. Uh, also, I know I don't always get things right with my takes, but um, this was slash is my journey of coming to terms with embracing and loving my own diagnosis. So thank you to anyone watching these videos and thank you to those who've reached out to share your own experiences. It, it might sometimes take me a while to respond to emails or messages, but I do read them all and I do enjoy the contact and I, I will respond. So uh, thank you so much and see you next week. Cheers.